Well, hello all and thank you for coming. If you would like to get the material that will be presented in this talk, you can go to this link. It's all sitting nicely and quietly dying in a GitHub repo. I also hate when people start their talk with an outline, so I, I thought I'd do the same thing because it always sounds like they have a problem with this, they overcome something, and it ends with people pontificating. So I'll do exactly the same. Sure. My name is Milos Milkovic. That's tough to pronounce and spell, but hey, deal with it. By day, I am in the same line of business as Walter White. And by night, I consult in spatial and hyperspectral image analysis. And now the question is, what or who could possibly drive a chemist to start doing audio analysis? And in 2015 USA, there is only one question. It's Obama. Uh, this year's State of the Union was my 15th since I immigrated to the US. And to me, it always seemed that there is a lot of applauding, which really is not reflective how bad or good uh, the year was. But this year, I was determined to quantify how much of applauding was there, and what were the phrases and sentences that, that, that triggered this applauding. And after a bit of work, my, my suspicions were you know, proven true. Uh, the Congress did the plot quite frequently, except a few boring parts at the beginning and towards the end, I guess, when they didn't want to wake up Justice Ginsburg. And they also applauded a lot. They are they, percent shy of quarter length of the whole address. And this has changed in time because if you go back to C-SPAN, you, you'll see that you know, Ronald Reagan talked for 35 minutes and he was done. And nowadays we are in the age of, you know, one hour long uh, State of the Union addresses with 25% of that spent applauding, which is kind of weird. So th th that's, that's how, how I started this whole thing. And then while I was doing that, somebody in my Twitter feed posted a link to a blog post which had uh, described how you can do song matching. And I skimmed to the post, saw spectrograms, yay, Java, boo. And thought, you know, let, let, let's do this in, in, in Python. And the research in this area is quite active. You know, it, it kicked off in the late 90s when the computers were powerful enough to, you know, aid this analysis. And I remember reading a paper from 97. It would take them around four minutes to analyze a song, which is incredible that today we have these little slabs in our pockets which can do it, you know, in, in a split of a second. Now, who's doing this? Uh, lots of research groups at various universities, you know, old and established companies like General Electric and Philips are also in this game. And quite a few startups, of course, uh, are also doing this. Why would you do it? Well, it's either intellectual curiosity or you want to make money by basically monitoring all types of streams that are out there and you are either trying to enforce your copyright or you're trying to collect your royalty fees. And that, these are the, the two main drivers. Or sell an app which can settle a drunken dis dispute in a bar, like what song is that? And after my research was done, all but one paper followed this simple scheme. They would start really nice, you know, let's make a spectrogram. I'll tell you soon enough what is a spectrogram. And then they would proceed to describe their algorithm, which if you're a kind person and you're in a good mood, you would describe as some sort of Rube Goldberg machine. You know, something is moving, it's making noise, it seems to be working, but trying to follow out what's really happening in these algorithms is a mess. Until I stumbled upon that outlier. It's from Andrew Wang from Shazam. It has a great title, an industrial strength audio search algorithm. You know, they mean business when it's industrial strength, right? It's, I mean, text is easy to read. Figures are surprisingly related to what they're trying to say in text. And it's seven, seven pages long. Now, if you can describe your company's core business, an algorithm in seven pages, that has to be good. And now this is a obviously gray area. 
since you know this is a paper for which they also have a patent. So I will describe everything that you would need to do, but not assemble it for you. So you are a smart group of people, so you'll be able to figure out what are the missing links and do it on your own. And back to high school, sound is waves propagating through a fluid, impinging on your eardrum, and your brain determines it as a sound. There are two distinctive features that you know, us humans can, can distinguish. That's the pitch. And humans, it, it, it's a kind of you know, a common thing. Humans can hear from 20 to 20 kilohertz. This depends on age, gender, general conditioning of your ears, and we can, of course, distinguish the loudness. Loudness is measured in decibels. This is a logarithmic scale, so it means that, you know, standing next to a jackhammer is 300 times louder than sitting in a quiet uh, study room. Human auditory system also has a peculiarity that it depends on frequency. Yes? Oh, it's frequency. It's frequency. Yes. Do you mean same pitch? Yeah. It's com combination of the wavelength. Yeah. There's a fundamental overtone. Well, you know, the, it's. A combination of those instruments. Most instruments have, like, in physics, like, they, they, they have the, the fundamental frequency and the, you know, the, the multiplications or multiples, and that's what gives them the timbre. But pitch is the building block, and everything else is a combo. I mean, Violin and saxophone will, will you know, produce the, the, the same tone, but it, they won't sound the same because of, 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 of all these differences in what they combine. And uh, human ear also is very good at you know, discriminating frequencies. And here's a bunch of curves that tell, tell us how much of an energy you have to pump at a particular frequency to produce the same level of loudness. And it means that you know, for, for, for high frequencies, you have to you know, put in a lot of energy compared to the mid-range frequencies. And if you're wondering why the hell I'm rambling about you know, human hearing when you know, it, this does not enter the picture of uh, quantifying songs, there is a simple reason that all you know, sound recording and producing devices, i.e. microphones and speakers, in most of the devices are mediocre at best and usually crap. And now if, if you imagine how does a song reach you, it's recorded in a pristine studio, then it gets messed around a bit, then it reaches the, you know, the radio station, radio station airs it, it reaches the bar where you're in, bar you know, puts this music through speakers, you whip out your phone, you fire up the, you know, the, the microphone on your phone. So there is a lot of degradation that goes on and all these devices are tailored to be very good at really narrow band of frequencies, maybe you know, 500 to 5,000 you know, hertz, and a lot of it is discarded, unless you're an audiophile and you want to spend you know, thousands of dollars for really high-end equipment. And, and, and that's why I'm mentioning this, because it, it, it's important to be aware that the signal you're getting is, is nothing that you will find in textbooks. It, it, it's pretty degraded, and, and, you, and you have to deal with that. Nowadays, all the music is in a digital format, and uh, it, it's usually pulse code modulated, which is a fancy word for saying it's sampled at regular you know, sampling points, which are determined by Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem. And it simply says you have to sample twice as much as the highest frequency that you have. And the intensity of the sound, the amplitude, is recorded as a 16-bit you know, side integer. And the, the odd part is, according to this you know, theorem, you, know, you should find your sound you know, being sampled at 40 kilohertz. But you know, CD audio and you know, HDMI and new TVs, they're usually at 48 kilohertz. And the reason is all these um, signals have to be filtered. And the, the filters that we have, they're not perfect. So they need a bit of a wiggle room to, to do their work. And, and, and they're called you know, you know, bandpass uh, transitions that you have there. The, the other way of describing the, the quality of sound is bit rate. And, and that's a simple math of figuring out how many samples you have per second and how many channels. 
and, and this is to illustrate that uh, a CD audio is roughly 1.4 megabits per second, and the best quality MP3 which you get is uh, almost, what, 4.5 times less than it. So these are the measurements of, of you know, sound quality that, that you know, we have. And at the center of all of this lies a short time Fourier transform. And you know, Fourier transform deserves a, a whole talk on its own. And it's you know, one of those unsung cornerstones of modern society since there would be no communications without Fourier transforms and two Johns, Cooley and Tukey. And there is a great talk that was this summer at Pi, uh, at Pi Data Seattle uh, by, by William Cox. He, he, he had uh, 50 minutes to explain. So if, if you want to have you know, an overview of Fourier transform, go to this link and, and watch his talk. It, it, it's really great. So where would you use short time Fourier transform and how it's different from regular Fourier transform? If your signal has frequency that are varying in time, and that is obviously the case, uh, you, you know, for speech, for audio, also for encephalograms and, and you know, earthquakes and seismology. They are also the fields who, who are heavily using this. And uh, short time STFT is uh, deceivingly simple. You know, you start, you take a window, uh, you know, of, of certain number of points of, of your signal. You apply something to them. You do Fourier transform. You slide it certain number of points, making sure it overlaps with, with the previous point. Again, do the Fourier transform and do that until you reach the, the end of your signal. And, and they always seem to mention or answer, you know, there, there are a lot of whys, like, you know, how long should this, you know, you know window be long? You know, how much should we overlap? You know, why do we, you know, do this, you know, messing with, with, with the signal called, called apodization? And, and these are crucial especially when you're dealing with signal of degraded quality. So I think this is time to turn to Jupyter Notebook. Sure. For mine, not a problem. Good. And w when I started, to, well, I, I, I wanted to start analyzing, I realized that I, you know, I threw away my iPod and I literally had no MP3s or songs to you know, mess around with. So I, I, I quickly you know, wrote some scripts to download from YouTube. This is not exactly copyright friendly, but you know, this is for research purposes. So if you don't have MP3s lying around, this is what you should do. And I, I mentioned earlier, you know, that, that, that thing called spectrograms. So what is a spectrogram is, uh, simply put it, an image where on x-axis you have time, or more precisely, you know, time bins of those windows that you had, and on y-axis you, you have frequencies. And now each pixel in this image is intensity at a certain frequency at a certain point in time, which you can analyze. And here, as an example of also really cool you know, physical phenomenon, I, I, I have three samples of sounds at 275, 250. So this is pretty mild. You can hear change in pitch. And to illustrate this physical phenomenon, I put two signals you know, that, that change mid, uh, you know, at, at, at midpoint. And you can see that you know, once you apply short time Fourier transform, you are clearly able to distinguish frequencies when, when, when they switch from one to another, but it's really hard to see the point in time when they switch. And if you pay attention, that kind of uncertainty is around 0.2 seconds. And going back to the signal, you can see that my signal is sampled at 11 kilohertz and my window is you know, 4K, which is roughly uh, a quarter of a second. And that corresponds to this uncertainty that you see in, on, in figuring out which signal is which. Now, if you move to a shorter window, 
now it's, it's only 1K, which means it's a tenth of a second, you can clearly see that now you can see where one single starts and another ends, or more clearly than the previous example, but you've completely lost the resolution in frequency. And this is good old Heisenberg's you know, uncertainty principle. People usually think of it as, you know, it's all about momentum and time and silly cat. It's really transferable to uncertainty in frequency and time. And here you have to make your, make your own trade-off. What do you care more about differentiating in time or differentiating in frequency? Or as it's usually the case, you make a trade-off. Yes? No, two, two notes at a time. So, so it starts 300 and 275, and halfway through it switches to, 300, uh, to 275 and 250. So it just drops by 25 hertz. Okay. Cool. And moving back on, you know, how does you know, this music look like when, when, when you look at it? How does something that sounds really cool and nice like this, when you look at its digital presentation, it's basically an ugly squiggly line. And why do we mess with it? What, one of the important facts about Fourier transform, it has to be symmetric. The signal has to be symmetric and periodic. And this is anything but symmetric and periodic. And to make this, you know, to kind of massage it in, into this form, that's why we apply those windows calling, you know, apodization, where you take another function, you multiply your, you know, signal segments with this function in order to make it somewhat symmetric and periodic, which now you can fit into your FFT. If you don't do this, FFT has nasty, you know, properties that it, it will start giving you really weird signals if, if it's not following this established uh, you know, math-driven problem. And they also tell you, oh, you take these, you know, two types of windows, hemming and hand, and you overlap them by 50%. Like, why? Like, well, I don't know. That's what my daddy told me. And it turns out there is a reason why you would overlap by 50%. It is these two types of windows sum to a constant when they overlap for 50%. So now you see that, you know, you have a pretty flat top, and why is this important is if you have signal like this and you do this, you know, apodization, you get signal that looks like this. And you know, you're using a lot of, you know, signal and power at the tail end. But if you overlap it by 50%, you'll be recovering this signal and power in the next iteration. And since it's all a constant line, it means that once you're done with analyzing your, you know, spectrogram, you can do, you know, inverse short time Fourier transform and go back to the original, you know, song, sound. And this is also now we'll be switching to looking at uh, spectrograms of songs actually. And it's always good to look at your data. You know, you would expect data to be nice and clean, but it never is. And this is a spectrogram of one of the songs that I downloaded. And you can see that the signal is completely gone after 17 kilohertz. So it, it, it's wasting space and, and giving you no information uh, about the song. So what you would probably do is just clip this uh, useless part of the song that you have. And now, once you have something that would probably look like this, question starts, how do you now somehow encode this in a way that can be quantified and used for, you know, some sort of classification or, or ID in scheme. And it's simple, but, you know, instead of thinking of this as frequencies and times and intensities, think of this as an image. So an image, you know, there are always, you know, peaks and troughs. And most likely, you know, peaks are the ones that are important. So you simply go looking for peaks in your image. And once you establish the scheme, which you would like to look, you know, how are your peaks found, you can see that, you know, these are some points there. And 
looking at one song compared to another, you can see, you know, there is some difference, but, you know, you, you'll never be comparing whole songs. You'll be always having just a time slice, which is a, a part of the whole song, and it would be really hard to have some, you know, pattern matching algorithms because, you know, it, 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 it's not that easy to, to achieve. And what you do now, once you kind of have the positions of all these uh, peaks that, that, that you uh, determined are relevant for that, and how do you determine you know, which peaks are really relevant and which are not? That, that, that's a whole engineering problem. You want your, your scheme to be relatively robust in terms of noise coming through. So you, you probably should set some threshold in terms of you know, peak intensity, relative or absolute. So if your signal gets degraded, you have enough robustness that you know, noise is not starting to come through. And you also want to have some spatial separation between the peaks because if two peaks are really close, they're not giving you that much info globally. What you would really like to have is a lot of you know, peaks spread all over as much as you can because this increases then the entropy of your system and then you know that the more entropy you have the, the easier it will be to find out what you're looking for. And now the next step is how do you transform this in, into something that you, 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 you can use for, for ID and uh, one of the beauties is everybody has some scheme of how to spatially locate these peaks. And the easiest way is you pick each peak, you throw a, a forward-looking quadrant or space of any shape that you would like, and say all the peaks, other peaks that are captured in this uh, you know, quadrant or space, they are probably related to this peak. And now you establish this you know, pattern of peaks that you have. But you know, this is not enough because uh, the, the thing is, all songs kind of sound the same for one reason or another, but that's, we'll be getting to that. And now once you, you have all, all these peaks pick up, you can start somehow hashing them. And you can see it's very easy. It's easier not to hash them as a, as a group of peaks, but you know, hash them as pairs. So you would take the, the frequency of each of peak pairs, record those two frequencies together, add also the time differential that is separating those two peaks, and pass it through the hashing function of your choosing or liking. So that, you know, step one is fairly easy. And if you ever had misfortune to sit around campfire and listen to annoying guy with ponytail and guitar, you know that all songs sound the same. But the, the reason is, you know, all artists, you know, kind of, you know, follow or are inspired by another. So it's not uncommon to find, you know, a set, you know, number of tunes or notes reoccurring in many different songs. I mean, that, that, that's what you would expect. I mean, music is just combining, uh, you know, a limited set of, of, of notes into something that's, that, that's unique. And this is the, the beauty and simplicity of, 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 of their algorithm. Now that you have the whole song, you have your slice with you know, what you would like to kind of identify which song it is. There is one thing that is common to you know, correct pairing of this time slice and whole song. And that is, you know, that hash that you found, it might be present not only in this song, but in many others. But what is unique about this song, that all hashes found in this you know, search time slice compared to the whole song have the same relative difference between the beginning of the search time slice and the whole song. And again, this me explaining sounds kind of you know, you know, confusing. And this is again part of gray area where, where you know, but if you, you know, like using SQL databases, you can do this fairly easy. 
with two simple tables. So you need one table where you store your songs, song ID and song name, and your fingerprint table where you store your hash, again, your song ID, and that offset time. And now what happens at search time? So you have some search hashes, right? Your uh, query will recognize and find all the hashes. So you will have hashes that are the same but with different song names. Then the, the next kind of query that you do is, you know, find me the hashes that have, you know, these hashes and also this time, you know, uh, relative time difference. And then each hash found with song name will also have a tag of that relative time difference. And now you can pull or make a simple histogram of, you know, song ID, how many hashes found, how many time, you know, time differences found. And the correct song will usually have the highest number of these, you know, time, relative time differences. And that's, you know, then you can think of, you know, what scheme would you uh, use to describe is it winner take all, you know, do you have some certain false positives, false negatives that you would like to, to play around. And it's also funny, and, and this always, you know, kind of surprises me that the power of Python, all of this is achievable with baseline functions, wine, you know, one-liners, which you can find, you know, in SIP reading audio. Matplotlib, make a spectrogram. Psychic image will find those peaks for you. And I'm talking, again, if you use short name, you know, variable names, all these functions can fit within 89, 79, you know, characters on your line. And you don't even have to go to, uh, you know, SQL database if you want to see how this works. Instead of, you know, having SQL database, you can have your hashes and everything stored, you know, in dictionary, then again, you can do a simple, you know, Python hash, you can intersect your sets, and voila, you know, the, you know, big multi-billion dollar company like Shazam can be represented in, you know, five lines of code, which is amazing, you know, I, it, it, it's so nice to see that business can be made out of simple things. Now, once you have this working, uh, you know, the, the famous question, but does it scale? Well, that's, you know, more of an engineering question, you know, how, how, how big your data size at the end will be. You would probably have to optimize for search time and network traffic because everything that, you know, you do locally is, you know, bound by, you know, hard drive seek times and all that stuff. And there are two kind of caveats with, 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 with this algorithm is you cannot mess with, you know, a play speed because you're relying a lot or almost exclusively on the positions of those, you know, peaks and hash marks which are encoded in that. And if you speed up a song or slow down a song, it will be thrown off because your database will be recorded, well, database will be created with, let's say, you know, play speed one but if radio, sometimes radio stations actually do that. They kind of like, you know, speed up music just enough that it will throw off the, the detection. And there is a small wiggle room of around, you know, one to 2% how much this can be tolerated in your database before uh, the, the searches start going all over the place. And what is also neat is you can uh, weasel out the artist who uh, lip sync on concerts because if you compare you know hashes from a recorded you know studio album and hashes from a, a live concert they're never the same you know if, if, if you get around 70 percent of you know correspondence that's really good it means that the band knows how to keep its rhythm and, and the singer can do the same but if they hit for their live concert you know the same hit rates as you would find on your CD they're cheated they're lip syncing and that's it all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention.